Cum găsi la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere? După o lungă perioadă de timp în care subiectul climei și al științei mediului a lipsit din structura emisiunii, anul acesta am avut parte de o întâlnire inedită cu un profesor universitar, fost pilot militar, care mi-a oferit prilejul de a aborda acest subiect dificil. Climatologul Tim Ball este născut în Anglia și a absolvit liceul la Londra, dar cea mai mare parte a vieții sale a trăit-o în Canada. El a studiat mostrele de gheață arctică timp de 9 ani, le-a analizat în laborator, dar era și pilot militar, așa că în zborurile sale putea vedea fenomene meteo pe o panoramă vizuală de sute de kilometri. Tim Ball avea și calificare de previzionist meteo în cadrul forțelor aeriene canadiene. Ceea ce a urmat mai departe au fost 25 de ani petrecuți în universitate, studiind climatologia la modul teoretic. În urmă cu 10 ani am început și eu să studiez principiile fundamentale ale modificărilor climatice și multitudinea de factori generatori, descoperind cu imire că de fapt activitatea omului e nesemnificativă în raport cu manifestarea marilor sisteme climatice de pe glob. Activitatea omului are o pondere semnificativă doar pe zone restrânse, doar în cele intens populate și industrializate. Ceea ce nu am reușit să produc în această carte însă a fost abordarea multidisciplinară și transformarea ei într-o unitate cu adevărat funcțională. Ea nu este altceva decât o colecție de date ce necesită reactualizare. Tim Ball mi-a oferit o nouă viziune și perspectivă inedită asupra științei mediului, iar aceasta este o multidisciplină care conține o mulțime de semnificații. Spuneam într-unul din episoadele anterioare faptul că pe măsură ce noi devenim tot mai conștienți de noi înșine, în același timp devenim mai conștienți de mediul înconjurător și locul ocupat în natură. Spuneam la un moment dat și doresc să reamintesc acest fapt, cele cinci ore la care am avut prilejul să asist în luna martie nu sunt lecții despre știința mediului accesibile doar celor avansați, ci ele sunt lecții de viață din care aflăm acele lucruri despre natură, mediu și sisteme climatice ce își regăsesc utilitatea imediată în necesitățile vieții noastre. Prezentarea profesorului Tim Ball este o călătorie interdisciplinară, astfel construită încât e ca și când știința mediului ar fi doar una singură și care se revelează prin fațete distincte precum un diamant bine șlefuit. Profesorul Tim Ball ne prezintă o realitate vie și complexă a modificărilor climatice, a fenomenelor naturale de risc, într-o ilustrare ce parcurge domenii interdisciplinare, precum fizica atmosferei, Biologie, istorie medievală, geologie, climatologie, sociologie, psihologie, elemente de logică și filozofie științifică, științe agricole, geografia mediului, ecologie, electromagnetism, geomagnetism, astrofizică și arte vizuală. Despre toate acestea am vorbit în episoadele trecute. În cel de al cincelea și ultimul episod din această miniserie, Vom încerca să sistematizăm câteva concluzii. Vom vorbi despre marile circuite climatice, El Niño la Ninia, din Oceanul Pacific, problema solurilor, creșterea plantelor, urșii polari, vom afla mai multe despre aerosol și influența acestor asupra temperaturii mediului, după care Tim Ball ne va spune și concluziile referitoare la întreaga sa activitate și conceptele filozofice care l-au ghidat și condus în cercetare și, desigur, vestea bună este aceea că mi-a promis o colaborare pe termen lung. Așadar, multe alte interviuri și discuții pe teme legate de știința mediului. Cea mai mare problemă ce îmi părea de netrecut era aceea că specialiștii din domeniul mediului și al geografiei mediului nu au și probabil nu pot face abordările multidisciplinare de care aș fi avut nevoie pentru emisiuni. Fiecare își cunoaște foarte bine o anumită felie sau subdomeniu de specializare, dar acestea nu sunt decât piese ale unui joc de puzzle care nu puteau dezvălui imaginea de ansamblu. Nici istoria nu e o știință unică, ci este o multidisciplină, dar ceea ce se predă în școli e doar o felie extrem de îngustă ce limitează și chiar distorsionează imaginea de ansamblu a istoriei ce cuprinde de fapt toate aspectele vieții. Fiți alături de noi la acest eveniment special la Știință și Cunoaștere, împreună cu profesorul Tim Ball. Dear Professor Tim Ball, welcome to our Science and Knowledge TV program in Romania for the amazing final 
part five of our second very long interview. Yes, it's been a long interview. I hope people have, have been interested because I, I think that we need to understand our world. It is really amazing and I'm so happy you are doing a great effort to record so many hours of interview and I thank you a lot. You're very welcome. Last time we remained to talk about another very interesting natural phenomenon and that is the forest migrations and forest mixing when climate conditions changes. Also the changes in the albedo of the lands creates local changes in temperature because darker colors attract more heat while snow and light colors reflect it. And this is why Greenland remained white for so many thousands of years. We could change its name to white land rather than Greenland. Can you tell us more examples? Yeah, the uh, back to the before we with well, the albedo is is the, the surface color, and one of the things that um, it, the amount of the sunlight coming in, the color determines how much of that sunlight is reflected right back to space, and then how much of it is absorbed to heat the surface. And I, I was starting to mention it in an earlier program, but we didn't get to develop it. But people must understand that temperature as we know it is, scientists call it sensible heat. That is heat that you can feel, all right? So there are other forms of energy that you can't feel the heat. But people say, well, I'm standing in the sun and I can feel the heat of the sun. They're not feeling the heat of the sun. What they're feeling is that when the sun rays hit the molecules on your skin, they cause, they cause those molecules to increase in their speed of movement. So every, mo every molecule above absolute zero, that is minus 273 degrees Celsius, every molecule is moving. And if energy is put into that molecule, it will increase its speed of movement. The faster it moves, the hotter it is. All right? So what's actually, what you actually say, well, I feel the heat of sun. No. What you're feeling is the sun hitting that molecule, causing the molecule to increase its speed, which you feel as heat. You can recreate that by friction. So if you, when your hands are cold and you rub them, what you're doing is causing the molecules to move more quickly, which you then feel as heat. All right? So the amount of sunlight that actually causes the molecules to move more quickly determines how high the temperature of that surface will go. Well, with a white surface, a pure white surface, the sunlight comes in, the shortwave energy, hits the surface and 100% of it goes back out. So if you have pure white snow, and, and by the way, um, working in the in the arctic with the um, eskimos or inuit as we call them a real problem is snow blindness because the sunlight strikes off the the snow and re literally burns out your eyes that's why people wear sunglasses right to reduce well the the um the eskimos built their own sunglasses which was a, a piece of bone and they would cut a very thin slit in it and they would wear them like a goggle and it reduced the amount of reflected sunlight off the snow stopped them burning out their eyes so with a white surface then all of the sunlight goes back out to earth that the percentage of light that's sent back out is called the albedo so in the case of snow the albedo is 100 it's 100 percent the earth has a shine to it so that when you're uh, the when you when you're looking at the moon, we'll get back to the Earth in a minute. When you look at the moon, we say, "Oh, moonlight." No, it isn't light. The moon does not put out light or heat. It's reflected sunlight. Okay, the albedo of the moon, because it's a dark surface, is quite low. So of all the sunlight that hits the moon on the light side, only 7% is reflected. 
So when you see the moon, you're seeing 7% of the reflected sunlight off the moon. And it, it can be quite significant. If you know, you get a dark night and you get moonlight, it can light up things quite well. It's quite amazing. If you were to, as the astronauts discovered, one of the things that surprised them was they're standing on the moon, the Earth comes up over the horizon, and then where you get moonshine, they got Earthshine because the sunlight hitting the Earth 37% of the light that hits the Earth is reflected directly back out to space. So the albedo measure of the, the Earth is 37, okay? And and the, the astronauts couldn't get over how bright the Earth was, the Earth shine was. If you've got a black, flat black surface, then of the sunlight hitting it, 100% is absorbed. There's no reflection of that light back out. So all of the heat is absorbed. Therefore, a black surface will heat up much more quickly than a white surface. Okay, and that's the difference. Now there's some contradictions in that. Uh, and of course, one of the contradictions is color because color is reflected light. And this is what um, Newton was looking at, the prism, the rainbow, you see the color of light. So in, in the sunlight, there's a, a, a wavelength that we call the visible wavelength. And it, it goes from violet at one end to red at the other end. And that's the colors of the rainbow. Beyond the violet is ultraviolet. We can't see that with our eyes because our eyes are a light detector. At the other end, beyond the red, is infrared, and we can't see that either. Okay, so our our the world we see is determined by the wavelengths that our eyes can detect. Color is simply the wavelength of light that is reflected off of a surface. So if you have blue, the particles that make up the blue are the same wavelength as blue light, about 0 0.43 microns, okay? So the light hits the blue surface, only the blue wavelengths are reflected back. Our eyes see that then as blue. And, and I used to tease my students and say, okay, I have a blue jacket on. If I get into a, a, a refrigerator and close the door, what color is my jacket? Right? The answer is there is no color because there is no light. All right. Now, the absorption of the heat is very important to heating the surface of the Earth. Now, where where people can understand this is you build a solar collector. You want to collect that heat. Your solar collector is black because that absorbs the most heat. Some places people uh, and, and the contradiction, by the way, uh, another one that they can think about is if black absorbs the most heat, then why are people in the tropics black skinned? All right? And the answer is because their skin color is nothing to do with heat absorption. It's to do with not absorbing ultraviolet radiation. Because ultraviolet radiation is absorbed by the skin into the body and creates vitamin D. And in fact, not enough vitamin D is a real problem. You see now they add it to milk, they add it to orange juice and so on. So the, the color of the skin is a, not a function of heat absorption, it's a, it's a function of uh, creating vitamin D in the body. The polar bear should be black because it's in a cold environment. But in fact, the polar bear is white for a different reason just like the person with the black skin. The polar bear is white because it wants to camouflage. It doesn't want to be seen by the creatures that it's preying on. But just a, this is another incredible thing about nature. And I've done a lot of work with people studying polar bears on Hudson Bay and so on. The polar bear, the skin of the polar bear is actually black. When you shave off its fur, the skin is black. People don't know that. There is then a layer of fur, which is very short, very thick, very dense fur. It keeps the heat in the body. 
so much so, and I worked with a scientist and he was trying to find a method of counting polar bears. Well, you go out, I mean, it's a very difficult job. It would be a lot easier to fly over with a, a uh, camera detecting infrared, which is the heat escaping from a body. And with an infrared camera, in other words, a camera that can detect only infrared light, it would show up. And so he flew over the polar bears, took the picture, developed the film, no polar bears. The polar bears fur was so efficient at keeping the heat in the body that no heat escaped from the body. And in fact, the polar bear controls its body temperature through its anus. That's how efficiently designed it is. But here's the other interesting thing. Well, if it's keeping all that heat in, how does the sunlight warm it up? Well, the polar bear has the short fur, but it also has very long fur. And that long fur is hollow. And the sunlight hits that and the heat is transmitted down in the fur into the body. And that's why this great myth you see with Al Gore, all the polar bears are drowning. Polar bears are superb swimmers. I have seen polar bears 250 kilometers out in the ocean paddling away. They're quite happy. Why? Because all of that hollow fur is like it floats. Yes, you, you told us also on the very first episode. Okay. How about forest migration and forest mixing? Okay, well, now, now the, the, the question is, and what I was studying was um, that the plants in an area or uh, that grow in an area, they're a function of um, the uh, soil. They're a function, and, and by the way, we should mention after a forest fire, the soil is changed. The chemistry of the soil is changed. So it, it also makes it better for those pine cone needles to grow. And then what will happen over time is that other trees will move in and gradually the forest changes and it goes through a sequence, what we call a climatic climax. So if, if the climate stays relatively stable, a certain forest will develop in a certain area. But one of the things that, um, that I was looking at was on a map uh, drawn in 1772, they marked the northern limit of the forest, the tree line. Now, you find that tree line as you go towards the poles, there's a limit of trees. Um, and then you get the same as you go up the side of the mountain. You reach a point where the trees stop, then you only get grass, then you get permanent snow. So going up the side of a mountain because you're going through different temperature zones, it's the same thing as going from the equator to the pole. And I, I playing on words, I love that because going, going on, uh, north is latitude, going up is altitude. So you only have to change the first two letters to get the same idea, altitude and latitude. Okay, but so the plants that grow in an area are limited in their area that they occupy by the soils, by the uh, temperature, and by the precipitation. So that determines. As the climate changes, the conditions, the, the tree plants can adapt uh, relatively uh, well in short periods of time. But if the, if the climate change continues, there's a point at which the plants can no longer survive, or they will simply move. And uh, one of the things that um, I was studying was on this map of 1772, um, and the, the, the guy that drew the map was a he biolo biologist. He knew all the Latin species and everything else. And where he drew the tree line was very different than where it is today. And he's talking to the uh, Indians about it, and they had an oral tradition. They said, oh, yeah, our grandparents tell us that when they were young, the tree line used to be much further north. And the, the scientist, this is 1772, very acute. He said, uh, clearly the climate has been getting colder in this part of the world. But of course, what he was seeing was the onset of the Little Ice Age that we talked about in another program. So so what I did was I plotted, and, and it, there's, an, there's a, 
the articles, I published these in scientific journals. I plotted where, where he drew the tree limit, as he called it, and he, and he explained all the species, and then where it is today. Now, I was very familiar with it, and it's a very distinct line. You go from clear forest, the trees get shorter, but then there's a very distinct line within a, within a matter of a kilometer, no trees. And, and um, so the question was, why had this tree line moved? What had caused it to move? There's two ways you can look at it. You can say that the tree line uh, was created by the trees, the albedo. So as long as the trees were there and creating a dark surface and absorbing the heat, that that they maintain themselves. Or was the tree line a response to the changing atmospheric conditions? Because if you plotted the tree line on a map, it coincided with the 10 degrees Celsius summer isotherm. Now an isotherm is a line on a map that connects points of equal temperature. Just like on a, on a, on a topographic map, uh, and you you have um, uh, you know line contour lines. They're lines joining points of equal height. All right. Well, an isotherm connects points. So if you draw the 10 degree summer isotherm, that's Ju July, uh, August, September, then oh, you you get uh, you that coincides with the tree line. So the question was: Is the tree line a, f a, a response to the atmospheric conditions, or is the atmospheric response to the tree line? I think the answer is that the tree line responding to the atmospheric conditions, but as the global temperature changed, the tree line moved. Now, what was interesting about this was the trees put out seeds and they spread spores. They spread, and um, it's, they will take root and grow. Uh, but in that part of the world, it's so cold that even if the tree start, the seed starts to sprout, the cold will kill it off in the winter. So the, the trees actually spread by putting out roots and then a new tree will grow up from that root. So trees can expand their area. Uh, grasses, other plants do it as well. They can do it either by putting out a seed, which is carried on the wind, and if it falls on favorable ground, it will produce, or they can do it by, by root movement. Um, what was amazing to me was in one part of the tree line that we looked at, the tree line had moved 200 kilometers in 200 years. That's a kilometer a year. And that's moving by spread of tree of, of roots. And that's a rate of change that much of modern science today say couldn't happen. But even if it's 50% wrong, if it's, even if it's only moving half a kilometer a year, that's a phenomenally rapid rate of change. But that's another part of what we're discussing in these programs is how quickly things change. Yes, this is really amazing. What I feel right now is that I should rewrite my entire book completely because now I realize that uh, it had been very poorly documented. Can you explain what is El Nino, La Nina, and what is Southern Oscillation Index? Okay, just before I get to that, don't rewrite your book. You you recognize where it is, but, but it's a very critical issue that we talked about very early in this program. You see, because um, we talked about von Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt, the universal man, the person who knew all the science was, that was known at that time. After Darwin, and with going out and collecting data, collecting information about different species, the volume of knowledge uh, became so great that no one person could incorporate it. So what happened was that people became increasingly specialized. Darwin wasn't called a scientist in his day. He was a naturalist. The term scientist only comes in, in really in the early 20th century. And what you've got now is that people have become so specialized in one small part of a very complex system that they can't see or put it into the larger context. And that's part of what we're doing. That's part of the difficulty you had in your book that you, your training 
And your understanding was in one small area of biology and botany and so on. But suddenly you find out that there's all these other things that are factors that determine what you're looking at. And and so uh, the, the, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but it's worth mentioning again. It's like the doctor or the patient is lying on the table and the specialist is looking at the feet, the podiatrist, the nephrologist is looking at the kidneys, the neurosurgeon is looking at the brain, and the nurse who has to deal with the whole patient and how they feel says, but doctors, the patient is dead, <laughs> okay? <laughs> well, they haven't noticed that because they're only looking at one part. That's what's happened in today's world the amount of information, so people have had to become increasingly specialized and and to the point where you you can't see the whole picture. And what's happened in Western society is, oh, if you specialize, you're a genius. If you generalize, you're a fool. But you have to generalize. And people in their world are trying to live in it. Like you think about being a farmer. And you have to know you have to know about chemicals, about seeds, about equipment, about markets, about economies. You have to have to know so many things. And I remember a farmer saying to me, you know, my, I'm having a problem with my soils. He went to the university. They said, we don't have anybody that studies soils. He said, we can, we've got a guy that can tell you about micronutrients and about colloids, but that's the problem. Now, back to your original question about El Nino and La Nina. What's happened as we've studied climate and we've learned about more of the mechanisms, um, a fellow by the name of Walker discovered that um, the ocean currents were alternating in the Pacific. And he found that uh, there was warm water on one side of the Pacific Ocean in certain years and then warm water on the other side of the ocean in, in specific years. Um, they thought this was something new. It was called El Nino. It was the appearance of warm water off the coast of, of northern South America and Central America, and it was called El Nino. The truth is that the people that lived in the area had known about it for centuries. They, in fact, uh, the um, uh, Inca people living in Peru knew about it, not specifically of the mechanisms, but for them, their basic food was potatoes. And with potatoes, the rainfall and when it occurs is critical to the success of the crop. And what the, what the leaders would do is they'd go up into the mountains in the spring and they would uh, look at the stars, a set of stars called the Pleiades. If the stars were twinkling, they knew the, that there would be certain precipitation patterns. If they were clear, there'd be different patterns, okay? What they were actually seeing, although they didn't know it, was that when there was an El Nino, there was heat rising. And with heat rising, of course, the stars became indistinct. The atmosphere wasn't as clear. So based on that, they would determine when to plant the potatoes and have a successful crop. There's a very good record of historical record of the El Nino going back to about 1500. Certainly when Drake, the English sailor, sailed into the Pacific for the first time in 1579, he got a hold of a, a Spanish navigator who then told him how to sail in the Pacific to avoid the winds and the currents associated with El Nino. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this came into climate science back in the 60s, and of course what happens is they discover some new mechanism like the Svensmark cosmic theory we talked about, and suddenly it becomes the explanation to everything. And I have to say, no, 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 it's just another mechanism that's part of this much larger picture. Um, they, uh, in the early days, they only talked about El Nino. And then, and El Nino, by the way, it comes from the Spanish. It means Christ child or little child because it occurs around Christmas. And that's why it got its name. And um, then they discovered that the opposite, the warm on the other side of the Pacific. So they call that the little girl. 
El Nino. And they then realized that there was this alternating. It then became called the Southern Oscillation. And it, it's, it's a, a standard pattern of shift of the ocean currents blowing, blowing towards Americas under, under El Nino conditions, blowing away from America under La Nina conditions. Um, again, nothing new, completely natural phenomenon. But again, the bias in our world the um, El, El Nino patterns shifted further north in the 1980s. And they had an, an El Nino in 1983 that actually impacted Southern California. And it caused uh, high tides and it caused uh, big waves. And all of these uh, Hollywood actors, their beach houses got washed into the ocean. Well, that's a tragedy. And unfortunately, we live in a world where if it affects California, it affects the whole world. It's the same way that if you have an earthquake in, in California, oh, there's news reports and everything else. Two, two people died. You can have 3,000 die in an earthquake in China. They hardly even mention it. So the, the bias of science and what the media are looking at and what the people understand became a part of the El Nino and um, as I said, it, it's a perfectly natural phenomenon. But here's the other interesting thing. Um, what, what's causing warm water on this side of the Pacific and then on this side? Well, the answer is that the ocean currents are reversing. Well, what causes the ocean currents? The answer is the wind. So for the ocean current to reverse, the wind has to reverse. Well, what causes the wind to reverse? Nobody talks about it. One, one uh, study done by um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, uh, sorry, I think of the name, Karen Lubitsky and um, a guy by the name of Van Loon, they, did, they showed that the El, El Nino pattern linked with sunspot cycles. But of course, because they say, oh, well, no, they, we don't know the mechanism, they will ignore that. But most of these cycles that we see, like the El Nino, La Nina, are related to um, the cycles of the of the solar activity. And what is the current situation of El Nino? Are we expecting uh, an El Nino event or a La Nina event? And how strong might it be? Well, they've got a bit of a problem going on because uh, there was supposed to have been a, a strong El, El Nino uh, this last year. It started to show up and then it weakened and um, it, the reason for that is because um, the, I think that what causes the reversal of the winds is the pressure of that um, the solar wind pushing down on the Earth's atmosphere. So if you think about, because the upper level winds reverse as well, and the question is what's causing them to reverse. If you think about um, a bellows, you know, a, a thing that you create wind with to keep your fire going. You know what I mean by that? Yes, yes. Okay. If you push it this way, the wind goes out. If you pull it this way, the wind goes in. And I think that the pressure of the solar wind on the atmosphere causes uh, the winds to reverse. So when, when it's there and then it's released, the wind pattern is reversed. The jet stream, because it's so strong, doesn't reverse itself but it changes its pattern from a very low amplitude wave into a much more extreme wave. Well, what's been happening over the last few years is that with the changes in the solar wind, we're seeing that change in, in the, uh, and so you're seeing more north-south winds, you're seeing areas of very cold, record colds well south, you're seeing areas of record warm well north. That's because the jet stream is changing. Again, it all, all relates back to changes in the sun. But those ideas are still not accepted by my colleagues in the climate science area. So you are saying that because we are already following a cooling pattern due to low number of sunspots, this will influence the El Nino not to happen it, yes, it, it, um, it's, cause, it's causing changes in the global wind patterns, not just El Nino and La Nina, but also in the jet stream. Yes. And we know that from the historic record. You know, when we talk about the Little Ice Age, 
we know that the wind patterns were significantly different. Please tell us about the atmospheric aerosols. This is another issue. And please explain the complex circuit that we can see on figure one. Figure one is the um, diagram created by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to put in a, in a, a simple form what we've just been talking about in the last couple of uh, programs, that is the energy coming in from the sun and you see in the center incoming solar radiation, 342 units. You notice that 77 units then hit the cloud and are reflected right back out. And then you see um, 168 units absorbed to heat the earth and 30 units going back out so you see that the 77 added to the 30 going back out gives you reflected solar radiation. That's the albedo we talked about. Yes. Okay? Yes. So 107 is about 30% of 342. Now, the Earth is heated, and on the right-hand side, that heat escapes out back to space. So over time, it's got to be balanced between the left and the right-hand side. And what you see on the right side is the um, 350 units of surface radiation going out and, and back out to space. But then where the big argument, and we, we could spend a whole program on this, but then they show back radiation. Well, that doesn't exist. See, what they're arguing is that the, the heat goes out into the atmosphere is absorbed by the greenhouse gases and radiated back to raise the temperature of the earth back radiation okay uh, and, and it's a li little bit beyond what we were talking about aerosols i'll just mention it now and by the way i only have about uh, 10 15 more minutes of time yes this is perfect yes okay um so the argument is that the earth is warmer than it would be without the greenhouse gases, but that concept of back radiation is what the argument's about. Um, uh, a lot of us don't think that that exists at all. But anyway, one of the things that you see in the center of that diagram, there's a comment that says, absorbed by atmosphere. Yes. Okay, that is energy from the sun that's hitting particles in the atmosphere, which are then heated up within the atmosphere. So it's directly warming the atmosphere. And you can see that they assign uh, 67 units to that. Okay, see on that, that left-hand diagram? Yes. Well, uh, the atmosphere, and we've already talked about spiders and, and, and we've already talked about algae. The atmosphere is absolutely full of dust and particles and gases. Um, the two terms that are used, and these have changed over time, but aerosols are generally referred to as gaseous particles in the atmosphere. Solid particles are called particulates, but the combination of them are significant in, um, they're significant in a couple of ways. The main way is in how the sunlight passes through the atmosphere, what's absorbed, what's uh, how it's uh, affected. The size of the particles in the atmosphere varies with height. So when you're down near the ground, you get particles that are larger than two microns, so that you can get quite large particles of dust. But as you go up in the atmosphere, those small particles either fall out by gravity or are washed out by the rain. So you only get particles uh, smaller dimensions above about 150 meters. Now, the, the small particles, by the way, are very important because our nose can only filter particles of a certain size. And, and so um, that happens to be around two microns, and that gets into the whole problem of air pollution and everything else. But the amount of aerosols and particulates in the atmosphere is into the billions of tons. It's just, just an enormous amount. And you can see that every housewife knows. You don't uh, not dust the furniture for very long 
and and the dust builds up on, on the on that surface those particles are we've already talked about them as being important for the formation of for condensation nuclei so uh, the clay particles, the salt particles, and, and other things, but also, as we talked about with the cosmic ray, the cosmic particles. Um, we don't really know how much, uh, how much aerosols there are in the atmosphere in total. We don't know how much it varies. We do know that a lot of natural events can change it significantly. For example, volcanic eruptions could put enormous uh, volumes into the atmosphere. We also know that the height at which they uh, occur is critical. So for example, if you have a volcanic eruption and it occurs at the equator and it, the eruption is straight up, if, that, if, the, if the particles get into the stratosphere, then it's very difficult for them to come wash out and come back down. And they tend to block portions of the sunlight. And that's why a volcano causes a lowering of global temperature with, with the dust particles. So it, it's another part of the whole atmospheric system that very few people know much about, and yet is, is, is very, very important. Because very few minutes remained, please let's have a closure and uh, please talk about your article entitled a review of my philosophical evolution yes okay um i i uh, aristotle who studied um education and how the brain develops and and his studies uh, are very well uh, described in a book by mortimer adler and he talks about Aristotle's views on education. And of course, as with any biographer, he probably ends up knowing more about Aristotle than Aristotle knew about himself. But Aristotle said that um, you can have children that can be uh, mathematical geniuses, but you cannot have a child that can be a philosophical genius. And what he was distinguishing was between the types of learning and the brain. And one of the great errors we make in our society is we confuse knowledge and intelligence. We assume that because children or people don't know something that they weren't intelligent. And then we set up a school system which doesn't allow for that. And one of the things that uh, Aristotle understood was that really everything the child needs to learn in life is learned by about the age of seven, and it varies with different children, but so seven through 12. He said, after that, everything goes towards physical changes in the body, the puberty and so on. So you're wasting your time with the child in school at that age. And that teaching history to a 12 year old to whom a week is forever they have no concept of history and time. It's a total waste of time. Now, you can, you can uh, uh, for example, when I talk to teachers, I say, do you ever talk about what it was like to be a child in history? How did children live in 16th century Romania? Nobody ever talks about it. It's all about the adults and the adults' children. And Aristotle said that you should let the child go to school till they're about I say between seven and twelve, then let them go out, get life experience, then go back to school when they're thirty, when they start to understand and they have a context and things. But of course, we've created a system where we've made the schools a babysitting agency, where we want to produce workers for the industrial society that we have. So. Um, I, I realized that, that that is very, very true. I had the good fortune that I got a good basic education in a Catholic school up to the age of about 12. But I, I dropped out of school and then I went into the military and I, I learned about the world and flying in the Arctic and all of these things. And then I went back, to, I lost my flying category because my hearing loss and I didn't want to 
fly a desk, as they say in the Air Force. No fun in flying desks. So I decided to go back to university. And at about that time, people were starting to become aware of environment and environmentalism. And it's what we call a paradigm shift. Societies function by seeing the world and seeing their the way they operate in certain ways. And then a new idea comes along and say, hey, we should do it this way. Well, what happens is most people don't want the change. They're afraid of the change. And so they tend to hold back. But there's a few people that grab the idea and the change and exploit it for their own money or control. Uh, and one of the things that I struggled with all my life uh, or my career was, what is the role of extremists? Why are the, there these fanatics out there, these environmental fanatics? What's the purpose of them? And I finally realized that their job is to define the limits of a new idea or paradigm for everybody else. So the example I use is feminism. Yes, we needed to treat women differently. We needed to treat them better and all these other things. But people are saying, well, okay, some of the feminists grabbed that and went off extreme. The majority of women are looking saying, well, yeah, we do need some changes, but how far do we go? Well, then the extremists start doing crazy things and the women, majority of women say, no, no, now we're losing more than we're gaining. So that defined the limits for the majority of people. Well, that's where we are with this environmentalism, that it was a very necessary idea. And I was very early an environmentalist saying, it doesn't make sense to soil your own house or to dirty your own nest. You know, it just doesn't make any sense. So, uh, but a few people grabbed this idea and said, oh, we can control everybody else and say, oh, you don't care about the planet. You got to live the way we want you to live. You can't have development. You can't have gold mines. We're going to stop all of that. And, and of course, majority of people were saying, well, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but how far do we go? Now what we've got are the extremists saying, oh, well, we, 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 we've got to get rid of all the people on the planet. You know, or we're too many people living here, or we, we, got, we can't do that. And so people are stopping and saying, no, okay, you had a good idea, but now you're getting crazy. That's where we're at now. But <clears throat> I was in on, on the very early movement of that. There was a, a conference around a book called um, Man's Role in Changing the Face of the Earth. And it came out in 1968. And that was at about the time that I got out of the military and was going back to university. And um, it really caught my attention um, because, and it was an ironic thing, we talked about soils earlier. Uh, the formula, scientific formula for soil is that soil equals PM, which is parent material, times precipitation, times temperature, times organic, and there was the letter O in the formula. And I said, well, what's organic? And well, they said, well, that's worms and roots of trees breaking up the soil and creating the soil. And I said, well, where's humans? Humans create soil and change soils. Well, humans weren't included. And suddenly I realized that we were not part of the natural system. And so that's really what got me uh, interested in, in, in looking at, at this um, situation. And, and so um, I deliberately, because I went back to university as a mature person, knowing what I wanted to do, knowing what I was interested in, my, my uh, first thesis was uh, philosophical. It was the considerations of humans as an agent of change. So how are we causing changes to the earth and the earth system? Then my second master's thesis was I knew I had to understand science and scientific method. So I wanted, I looked at energy and its inputs into creating things. So I looked at the energy inputs of wave and wind action in creating a beach. And I took samples and did studies and analysis of that. And then I realized that we needed much longer records to see how change occurs over time. 
So my doctoral thesis combined the historic records of the Hudson Bay Company, who started keeping instrumental records as early as 1768, who kept daily weather diaries. And what I did was that I took their record, and of course they were there, both their survival, their food source came from the land, but also their economy from the furs. And, and so they kept very detailed records. And so I, what I did was I took their detailed weather, daily weather records using us, they used a scientific recording method, same as ship's logs are done. And I created a coding system and generated 6 million digits of weather information from which I could then look at, well, how do precipitation patterns change over 200 years? How do wind directions change over 200 years? Started to get an, an, an idea about how much nature changes and how rapidly it changes. And of course that then led me into teaching about weather and climate, but it also led me into um, some of the things that are critical. For example, water, drought, single most important issue. And notice by the way, all of the focus at the government level is on temperature, but in the short and long term, what happens to precipitation is much more important. We talked to the, about that with the soil moisture. And and then the other thing that I, I got interested in was I realized that you could understand history and you could understand geography and you could study them independently. But if you're really uh, going to understand human history, you had to put the history onto the landscape. And how did the landscape change? And how did the climate change? And how did that affect human history? So what I taught my students was that geography was the stage and history was the play played out on that stage. And unless you put the two together, you really couldn't uh, understand what was going on. And that basically has been my life work for the last 40 years. Dear Professor Tim Bali, thank you very much for this new amazing series of interviews on science and knowledge and let's meet again as the climate changes will intensify because I presume that this will happen in our lifetime. And I thank you for all these wonderful explanations which now clarified a lot of myths and misunderstanding. Thank you very much, Christian. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, I'm ready to help any time I can. I am happy beyond words, and the words cannot describe how I feel after five hours hearing all these news I was not aware of. Yeah, it it just opens up a whole new world, doesn't it? Was it's that's what it, you know. Somebody once said, "If you think education is expensive, try ignorance." Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Thank you. Aceasta a fost aventura noastră în domeniul cunoașterii climei și a mediului, în urma căreia mi-am format o nouă viziune de ansamblu asupra ceea ce se întâmplă. Multe alte lucruri au rămas însă necunoscute sau neelucidate. Dar ceea ce știm cu certitudine este faptul că toate condițiile de mediu și factorii naturali implicați își modifică influența în permanență. Și nici măcar un singur parametru nu rămâne constant. Profesorul Bal ne atrage atenția că s-ar putea să ne confruntăm cu o perioadă de răcire, fie ea locală sau globală. Dar, dincolo de aceasta, cel mai important lucru pe care domnia sa a încercat să ne-l transmită în acest serial a fost că încă nu cunoaștem mecanismele naturale suficient de bine pentru a formula concluzii categorice cu privire la influența omului. Putem cel mult bănui existența tiparilor climatice și modul cum ele s-ar putea manifesta în viitorul apropiat, dar nu avem mijloacele necesare sau energiile pentru a le împiedica să se manifeste. Citez o frază interesantă dintr-unul din episoade. Din când în când, natura ne reamintește cine e șeful. Îmi place uneori să închei pe marginea unor aforisme legate de știință și cunoaștere, pe care le-am mai repetat și cu alte ocazii, și anume... Știința este procesul folosit pentru a căuta adevărul și nu este o colecție de adevăruri. De fapt, cel mai bine știința ar putea fi definită ca o cunoaștere aranjată și clasificată în conformitate cu adevărul, faptele și legile generale ale naturii. Cunoașterea a fost, este și va fi întotdeauna o aventură nesfârșită la marginea incertitudinii. 
Fiți alături de noi data viitoare la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.